And thank you very much for joining us once again on PM Express. PM Express, as you know, is always brought to you by Territory Properties. We develop spaces as though we were going to occupy them ourselves. Syntex tanks, it is strong, it is tough, alumobitus, experience greatness in every moment, and the Ghana AIDS Commission. And desires are wishes. Beauty is a promise of happiness, but passion is everything. Thinking about buying a new home, talk to those who build with passion. Sloan Square is a new gated community development at Sakumono. It is developed by Cherry Tree Properties. It's a one-of-the-kind, well-planned luxury you've never experienced. Why don't you call them? It's 055-3662-366. Cherry Tree Properties, sophistication and class. If you're building and you want water tanks to save that water, you need to call Syntex Tanks. The first to introduce the double layer tank, and now you can also have your own specs. They have the white inner layer tanks in Ghana. The customer specs order allows you to order any color and size of preference. Syntex tanks gives you the longest warranty of seven years, which no other tank gives you in Ghana, by the way. And so whatever your water consumption, size of project or demand, choose Syntex tank. They have agents nationwide, so you can call them. 0244-335-168 or simply shop online at syntexgh.com. Syntex tanks, a strong, a tough. Tonight, my guest on the show was recently on PM Express, but I've asked to ask him to come back on the show. Why? There have been a few issues that he's spoken about in the last two months that, again, were very thought-provoking. One of them is the Ghana Trade vulnerability report and he had a very interesting take on that and one that again jolts you into thinking about the Ghanaian circumstance but I'm also very curious to get his thoughts on what has been happening in the sub region the sweeping of the region by this coup fever and what are his thoughts on it many say it's just a manifestation of the citizens grievance at the lack of the democratic dividend whatever that is I'll pick his thoughts on that on the show. You know him, he is Yai Sako. He is not afraid to speak his mind. He is a pan Africanist, but of course, he's a former executive VP of Unilever. Thank you, Yao. Thank you very us. much, Evans. Thank you very much for having me again. And grateful that uh, you agreed to sit with us again. Okay. Let's, let's start with the first one the Ghana Trade Vulnerability Report. And you wrote a, an article on it and you pitched it as a critique of new liberal capitalism. Why? Well, that's what we have been doing for decades. The outcome is before us with granular data, and I think the starting point is to be thankful to the Ghana Statistical Service that they reduce the debate to objective terms and quantitative expressions that make it very easy, therefore, to have the conversation. And it just tells us the state of our trade. We don't have to argue the numbers are there. They don't lie. So. I see it as a reflection of the sum total of what we have been attempting to do for decades. And what we have been attempting to do is neoliberal capitalism. But what's wrong with it? Well, what Unless I'm doing it and succeeding. Who? Well, if the US who say, well, they are neoliberal. Everybody can do what they want, and it benefits the rest of us, at least as a theory. UK and the Europe who say same as well. If you put a magnifying glass over those societies at $3,000 per capita GDP per annum, you find a very strong involvement of planning, of making sure that the state was competent, creating the environment in which the private sector could have agency. Things like Silicon Valley did not just spring up on private initiative, they were planned. Many of the big organizations in the U.S. that we know of as big businesses, they got big contracts with the military, with other arms, etc. So what you actually have when you put a magnifying glass is a mixed economy. One that they realize that the state makes markets efficient. It creates the environment within which markets can flourish. The abdication of the responsibility of a competent state that, you know, capitalism sort of precipitates, all because it is chasing a return to shareholders, what is called shareholder primacy, you hardly see has delivered anywhere. Far. I don't know an example where it has delivered a society from poverty to prosperity. 
But why is our poor showing in which was exhibited in very glaring terms in the trade vulnerability report that in essence shows that really since Nkrumah we haven't changed much in terms of the very structure of this economy. We're so import driven, we are still not trading with ourselves on the continent and we are consuming and not producing. But why, why, why is that a fault? Of new liberal capitalism. Well, that's the outcome. That's uh, what you do when you're you're pursuing your liberal capitalism is essentially shareholder primacy. So you think very short term. The uh, thing is driven by quarterly cycles. What are the shareholders going to say? You're also willing to get the return by any means necessary. Ghana is going through the throes of the whole ecological system being damaged because of Galam say. That is a typical example of what happens. The end-to-end -end value chain, taking responsibilities for your externalities, is not present in neoliberal capitalism. All that people do is that they want a return and you damn the consequences. So these are the sorts of issues that you're talking about when you're driven by huge amounts of short-termism. The countries that have made it to prosperity, they talk about 20-year plans, 30-year plans. We are forever talking about the quarter, the budget cycle, you don't change systems like that. So we are where we are and have not changed significantly since independence because we've not made structural interventions. And if you want structural outcomes, you have to make structural interventions. I was looking recently at uh, the Chinese reforms as an example. In 1980, Deng Xiaoping at that time, in 1980, was 76 years old. But he launched a 20-year plan and said that China would move from a GMP per capita of $200 per annum to 800 quadruple the GMP per capita as a proxy for industrial and agricultural output. And they were clear in their minds that if they were able to do that, they would get to prosperity because their country had better distribution than most of the developed world. What is our equivalent? That's, that's the challenge. We're moving from one budget cycle to another, then we miss, then we come back. And because we are not looking long term, we are not placing the structural issues that need to be changed on the table. And I look at the numbers the statistical service gave up. And if you drill down a bit more to say the 12 months that they looked at, three of those months we exported more than imported November, December, and March. The nine, obviously. You see the story there, which is what you've been talking about. Doesn't that show that it, at least it is possible to do it? Scaling up? We are thinking too short term. I, I, don't, I mean, three months, how can you assess anything in three months? I like to look at what are, what are the outcomes of a decade, for example. When you talk the Chinese reforms and its impact, you are talking about reforms that were initiated since 1978. They launched the 20-year plan in 1980. Deng Xiaoping actually said we must think about the 20 years to the end of the century. That was then 1980 to 2000. And plan for the 50 years of the following century. This is a 70-year plan that they were talking about. So when I hear something went up three months, that's a blip. You, you, you can't establish a trend or a pattern, but it is very much in typical, characteristic of, of neoliberal behavior that we get excited. I sat in a presentation once and we're talking about the CD and structural things that needed to be done. And one economist was telling me about a three-week trend. I said, what can you do with a three-week trend? So yes, within a year, within two years, there'll be some ups and downs. But where are the trend lines headed? That's what we must analyze. And if the trends bother us, then we must intervene. You talked a lot about Deng, Deng Xiaoping, and you, you cite him in your... Yeah. And, and I like the quote you talked about is, he made the point that the, if you really want to get somewhere, then you have to dare to touch the backside of the, of the, of tiger. the tiger. But Deng Xiaoping's time and the context in which he managed to do the things he did as a chief policy brain for China back then for so long, he had longevity. He had one party. He can be there for long. Until he died, he was so very influential. That is not the structure we have. It doesn't allow anybody that, that 70 years you talk about to implement the sort of long-term vision that Deng Xiaoping, for example, has. Those are two different contexts. 
Yes, we like to give those sorts of excuses, but if you look at Deng's career, it's not as glossy as we, we make it seem. Uh, I think his own graciousness, the fact that he was willing to stop the undermining of Mao, who rusticated him because Chairman Mao rusticated him, so people thought he would be bitter, but he said, no, we were all in this together. Deng himself said, for 10 years, I lived in the cow shed, <laughs> which tells you something. He fought the gang of four, Ling Biao, Mao's wife, and the others. Uh, and when they led the cultural revolution, for 10 years, Deng was off the scene. In fact, from 1958, he started to run into difficulties because when they said the Great Leap Forward, he said it wouldn't work. That they were talking, the gang of four was talking a better, uh, an impoverished socialism than a rich capitalism. And Deng responded that if socialism only de delivers poverty, it will collapse. So he was called a capitalist roda. He was sidelined for 10 years, mm. but he fought back. He talked a lot in his lifetime about how they crashed the Gang of Four. And it was then that they were able to implement the reform. So I think people do not fully understand the Chinese system and they think there's no accountability, people just get there. This guy became a member of the Communist Party at 18, Deng Xiaoping. At 23, he was already General Secretary of the, com the Central Committee. At 28, he belonged to the top nine. They actually had posters, Mao and eight others in China. Deng, at 28, was there. Facilitated yeah. at one party. Yeah that had the iron grip of a power. The, the internal competitiveness, even the, the whole one party thing is not, is not very true. The internal competitiveness of the Chinese system is not fully understood. I'm not saying that we should go and adopt the Chinese system. They themselves say that they pursue development with Chinese characteristics. But there are things that we can learn from them. Such as? Such as long-term planning. The fact that then called out in his reforms for modernizations, defense, agriculture, industry, education, very clear. And they had stability. They knew what they were going after. They were working to a very clear econometric model. He said, we have 80% of the population. At the time, China's population was 1 billion. He said, we have 80% of the population living in rural areas as peasants in poverty. If we don't start by uplifting the conditions of the people at the bottom rank, there will be no stability in China in order to be able to carry out the reforms. So they first started by lifting the bottom so that people would have dignity. And they were also very clear. Deng and his team used to say, we are not aiming to be the most prosperous nation in the world. We are just trying to put in place reforms that will make our people live in dignity. We must sit back. When we, we build some of these capital projects that we are also very excited about and we talk about a new thing and so on and so forth, I talked the last time I was here about the April Partners report, 68% of our population is considered to be living in families that are classified as low income. So if you and I see another shining building somewhere and we are leaving people in that sort of situation and not doing anything about it, we are creating a system that can explode. And we are seeing what is happening in, in the, in the sub-region. Something the way, that Yes. The way that China did it was first focus on the people who were at the bottom of the rank in extreme poverty, move them into some degree of dignity, and then from that degree of dignity, they said to themselves, now we can go after the cities. In a way, they were going back to Mao. The Maoist revolution first encircled the cities from the rural areas, then they attacked the city. So in a way, they were doing that. But look at it carefully. You see the systematic approach that was taken to build education because the Cultural Revolution had called the intellectuals the stinking ninth. The Lin Biao and, and, and the others had said that intellectuals were not workers. According to their Marxist philosophy, they didn't see them as, as workers. And therefore, they denigrated them and created an anti-intellectual environment for which China suffered because they fell behind in international R&D. So they dealt with that. They said, if you don't sort out agriculture, you will not get rural wealth. You will not get enough food mm. to eat. So very systematic approaches and major structural changes were 
were made. And they were thinking long term. Not three months. What will, what, will, what will three months do? In fact, Deng said, when he started, he said the, the, the reforms that were needed in the rural areas will not show signs of progress for the first three years. It was in the fourth year. But isn't the case that the very structure of our Ghanaian democratic yeah. existence doesn't allow that long-term thinking and implementation? At least yeah. the structure means maximum eight years, you're out. Somebody else comes with different vision for the country, and then we, the recycle continues. By the way, Deng Xiaoping was in charge for 78 to 89, 11 years. So many people think that it was much longer. When he came to power, he was already in his mid-70s. And one of the things that is not very well known that he focused on was actually reducing the age of the members of the Central Committee. Uh, people don't talk much about that. Deng cut the bureaucracy. He in fact, it's, it, it is said that when he got to a city, he was a little bit retired to force the others to... He, he to actually said he wished that he could retire even before he started mm. the reforms, but he had to lead the reforms. But he kept on saying, we have to bring the age down because we were at our peak when we were much younger. The other thing he spoke a lot about was that the public bureaucracy was bloated. People don't talk about it much, but he, he reduced the numbers significantly. One of the ways was introducing a pension system. You know, his famous statement, there are too many temples, and each of the temples, too many deities. And we have to reduce those sorts of numbers. So it is more what we have allowed our system to become. But that's that, the system that, that, that we have. No, they have it in Singapore as well. Our parties have become corroded. They don't have consistency. So when one candidate moves, they, they talk about something, and you start wondering, is this the same political party? Some of the, the internal battles are almost fratricidal. Now, other more prosperous societies... But you mentioned Singapore. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we all know the celebrated leader who transformed it had 30 yeah. years to do it. But he contested, what, every five years, six years, seven years? I don't even know what the cycle is. He went but to if you people, were in Ghana, you yeah. only have eight years maximum. But he built, he built his party. Why are our politicians not building their parties to be sufficiently robust? One of the things that those parties in Asia spoke a lot about, and in Singapore I experienced it myself, the amount of time that the leaders of the PAP spent in rural areas with the masses engaged and so on. We are running this Santa Claus system. We see the politicians once in four years. We are entering the, the, the season of politics, right? Mm. So you hear the promises. I was watching the news, and this uh, DC says I'll do this. This says I will do that. This is a season of promises until the election. Then they disappear. So if you run a system like this, the constituent units, the building forces, the crucibles of, of transformation and change, which should be the political party, are themselves so significantly corroded. And the last time I was here, I talked a lot about the over-monetization of our politics. Singaporean elections, the democratic contest, are among the most economically efficient in the world because they guard it carefully. Mm. They don't allow people to just throw money in. So these are all the elements of neoliberalism. There are many more that we have to sit back and say, how do we change? Or else we are caught in this cycle. In your article on the trade vulnerability report, you say that the economy that had emerged and done something really great are those who are courageous. They, they want to challenge the status quo, but also have mass movements that are truly anti-systemic, right? How does that look like for Ghana? Well, well, in, in real terms, how does that translate to the, to the Ghana solution? Show me the, the politician in the top 10 of the political parties that has gone into the rural area, say Galamse, we are trying to solve the Galamse problem, and slept on tables and mats with, with, with the people who are living there and understood how and the economic be populist, cycle. So be. It's not populist. It is populist if you go there with cameras and you come and you come and show it. What, what do people in big businesses do? I, as a marketing director, used to go into mud huts in Yangpala. What, no water, no electricity. But these people are consuming your product. So you have to understand how they live. What are their aspirations? In what ways can you give solutions to your brands that improve their lives? But we don't have that. The, the character of our politics is not like that. We have created the, the Ghanaian big man. I, I see somebody was just fighting with me because I wouldn't let him take my bag. 
Yeah, so they get disengaged from, from the communities in which they are. So I unfortunately don't cut people slack on those sorts of things. The, the political parties, in order to become mass movements, must engage in very different ways. And we must stamp out the Santa Claus nature of our politics. What's I call that? it Santa Claus because Santa Claus goes around and gives gifts. And the people also wait for Santa Claus to come and give gifts. So at Christmas time, Santa Claus appears with gifts. Same thing. In the fourth year of our political cycle, the politicians appear, Santa Claus, with their gifts. And people say, yay, Father Christmas is here. Everybody takes their bit because they know they will not see them again. If that is the reward of our democratic system, then we are headed to trouble. You talk about mass movements that were anti-systemic. In Ghana, we have two main parties that have just rotated and, and done the cycle. They will tell you that they have mass movements of their own. This core group of five million people who always vote for the NDC or the MPP, that when there's a small minority in the middle, so-called floating voters who then swing the actual outcome of the results, isn't that a mass movement? Or that's not what you're talking no, about? No, not at all. I'm not talking about it. And by the way, we don't need to go all the way to, to China. We, we saw uh, Kwame Nkrumah was, was, uh, was pilloried for moving with veranda boys. But he created a mass movement in this country around the big idea of independence and was able to mobilize people, the railway workers, Bobby Biney and so on and so forth. So we've seen it here, here before. We, we don't necessarily need to, to go to China and so on and so forth. Where, where are the educational institutions of the political parties? You know, serious political parties, they have, they have big academies for training the Arcadias. They, they, they have ideals that they talk about. They explain to them their core philosophies. They teach Where are they? When they go into the hinterland, where are the efforts to really educate people? Our mm. politics has swung into a huge casino. You toss money into it, and you hope for a favorable outcome. I mean, dangerous statements are, are being made. I had one recently, a leader of a political party, making a statement that they too should get their judges. Are our judges now members of the political party? Are they there to represent political parties? Is this where we are headed? That the MPP has its judges, and the NDC also has its judges. And the leaders are saying to them, so there is a contest. Mm. We are headed into trouble. If, if, this is, if this is what becomes of the judiciary, I hope that the Chief Justice does not see it that way. Fortunately, she's not spoken and endorsed that point of view. But the fact that those sorts of statements can be made, those are the things that point to the reality that the coloration of our neoliberal politics is not what is optimum. And that's why we must learn from other people who... China is just one example I gave. Singapore, you could go to Singapore, South Korea, they are running more stable systems. Vietnam, they are running much more stable systems there. The Scandinavian countries, because I'm only talking about, about Asia, the Scandinavian countries, they too have these cycles. But they don't have this over-monetized nature. There's a big idea around their politics. Sh should we change the very structure of our democracy? As in, more specifically, should we change the four-year, maximum eight-year cycle? I'm not totally convinced that it is the cycle itself that is the problem. I just mentioned the Scandinavian countries. Mm. They, too have a, they too have a cycle. It is the fact that our politics is not powered by big ideas and consistency to chase them. So if a political party were to lose power today, in Anakufado leaves power, the opposition comes, what's the first thing that happens? Every board is dissolved. Mm. All ambassadors are recalled. The constitution empowers you to do Yeah, so. it does empower, but just because the constitution empowers you doesn't mean that you go around. The constitution empowers many things. But something fundamental yeah. must change for what you propose to So happen. the nature, first of all, the, con the constitution, you're right, must not be uh, that permissive. I agree that we have seen tremendous abuse of perhaps an over-permissive constitution, and we need to protect in some ways. I don't believe mm. that the strategic public sector boards, for example, should be appointed by governments. So just because a, a government leaves, why should the Bank of Ghana's board be dissolved? But this has now seeped through to our population to such an extent, the last time I was reading about it, I just shook my head. Public sector, uh, public toilets 
The guardians of public toilets now change when political parties change. Now, what sort of system are you running? Mm. So there's no continuity. And that is the bane of uh, we over politicization. The Chinese and many other parts of the world, people, people know this, they said to each, from each according to his ability. I'll be talking about this in a lecture mm. next month. From each according to his ability, to each according to his work. Ghana is running a system of from each according to his politics to each according to his politics. Uh, you can't sustain a country in that way. Mm. I, I want to take a break. When I return, also in this trade vulnerability report is the picture of what we do with the rest of the continent. And you think that in the era of the Africa trade in a continental free trade area and etc., we should be doing far better. But the report actually says that we're still trading more with Europe and Asia than we're trading with ourselves across the border here, although we still have a setting economic community for West African state. Emphasis on economic community. I'll ask him his thoughts on that because he, 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 he writes about that and, and then challenge him a bit where, where the evidence also suggests that we possibly may not be doing as bad when it comes to that area of things. And then we we'll get into, for me, I guess, the, everybody's talking about the coup, the coup fever sweeping across the sub-region. What, what is it? I've talked about the, our democracy. Is that what is happening elsewhere, that others are reacting to it by taking uh, to the streets or to the military to overthrow governments? I'll ask his thoughts on that. Stay with me. You're live on PM Express. Hello, my name is Abeiku Agri Santana. If there's anything that makes my life so easy, it is my bank. I love hanging out with my boys' boys at our usual fufu joint. But even without cash, we still need job better with EcoBank Mobile. No matter the time of day, my bank helps me stay in touch with my beautiful wife whenever she's away. And when my beautiful wife is in town, she never misses out on her favorite TV shows because I'm able to pay up all my TV subscriptions from the comfort of my mobile phone. Whenever she has to get groceries too, my bank makes it cashless and convenient. And the part my wife loves the most is when my bank makes it possible and easy for her to shop from any part of the world without moving. <laughs> Welcome to the smart world of Ecobank. Download Ecobank Mobile from Google Play Store or the App Store and discover the smart way to bank. Ecobank, the Pan African Bank. Daddy, Daddy, <sighs> this tank is big. Yes, that's true. It can store a lot of water. That's so true. Wow, it has a working surface like this. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I can see S I N mm -hmm. T E mm -hmm. S syntax. That is so true, my daughter. When it falls down, it goes That's not true. But why? Whoa. Hey. <laughs> Syntex was the first to introduce double layer tanks in Ghana. Syntex again was the first to introduce white inner layers in Ghana. Syntex gives you the biggest warranty seven years. No matter your water needs, Syntex is the answer. Syntex tank. Are you strong? Are you tough? My name is Tina. I am a person living with HIV. I got to know my HIV status after I gave birth and lost the child because of HIV. In those days, prevention of mother-to-child transmission services had low patronage due to fear and stigmatization. Today, many HIV-positive women have delivered negative children. I follow the guidelines and take my HIV medicine called ARVs every day as prescribed by my doctor. This makes me strong and healthy and also prevents me from passing HIV on to any future child. Please, avail yourself of PMTCT services when pregnant. It is the only way to ensure you do not pass the HIV onto your baby 
during birth or pregnancy. If you have tested for HIV recently and it was negative, test again when pregnant. If you have tested positive, go to the hospital after birth as directed by your healthcare provider. Your baby will be given medicine immediately and tested to ensure baby and mother are well. Let us work together to have an HIV free generation. Our children must be free to shine. All of a sudden, your voice are different. And when you try a call, Bama, bring me the honey whiskey. You know the one, Black Rock Whiskey. Honey whiskey. Shale, honey near their frow. Black Rock Whiskey is strong. Now, so test me is smooth. And it goes down easy. Uh, excuse me. Bama, <laughs> Bama. Bring my friend one Black Rock Whiskey. Black Rock Whiskey, blended with natural honey flavor. Hey, what's up? Bama. Hey, what do you want for us to come to us? The beer has been turned on. Oh. Me de ji 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 ji. Black Rock Whiskey. Tabby, the feel is smooth, Nasno. Drink responsibly. Not for sale to persons under 18 years of age and not recommended for pregnant women. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Daddy, Daddy, oh, this tank is big. Yes, that's true. It can store a lot of water. That's so true. Wow, it has a working surface like this. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I can see S I N T E S syntax. That is so true, my daughter. When it falls down, it will spoil us. That's not true. But why? Why? Hey. <laughs> Syntex was the first to introduce double layer tanks in Ghana. Syntex again was the first to introduce white inner layers in Ghana. Syntex gives you the biggest warranty seven years. No matter your water needs, Syntex is the answer. Syntex tank. Are you strong? Are you tough? There are days when you think, whoa, today I've earned it. So order a global. Days when plants run longer. What if we order a global? Or days when you can't control everything. Oh yes, because on global, you can order anything you want. Global, you order, we deliver. You are still on PM Express. My guest is Yao and Saku. We are talking about Ghana, but also the continent largely. Yao, in the trade vulnerability report, you also singled out the fact that, yes, you're trading significantly with Europe and the rest of the world, with the exception of Africa, at the time of Africa Free Trade Area. And of course, you, you raised that, that conundrum. But that has been what well, the way it's been. It's not only difficult to trade with the rest of the continent and even the sub region. It's, it's far more expensive to travel in a plane simply to any African country. Um, today I was in my son's school and I wanted to buy uniforms and they were importing the uniforms from an Asian country. Importing the uniforms and I, I'm like, I, I want to go to Mokola and go and buy it. He said, no, but if you go to Mokola, you can't find it. Isn't that the problem? For me, isn't that the problem? That it's far more difficult. You can't find the things either here or in another country. And so you have to go elsewhere beyond the continent. It's not really our fault, is it? No, when we talk about these things, it is not that we're saying that somebody should be blamed. What you described is the reality. The task of strategy, 
development strategy, business strategy, is to say, now that we know those constraints, now that we know those realities, how do we intervene? Otherwise, in our lifetimes, China was not prosperous. Mm -hmm. Why has it become what it has become today? In our lifetimes, actually we were quite old in 1994, uh, even you were yeah. <laughs> very aware, yeah, uh, Rwanda fell apart completely. It's not today a prosperous country, but it is a functioning country. So you look at your reality with a view to say, I always say this, development is about the reordering of the social relations around the means of production. Why is it expensive? What can we do to intervene? So what are the crucial, the critical factors that you can intervene over the long term? Mm. And that's where you intervene. If you simply take a snapshot of society and then you are paralyzed, well, that is a very defeatist approach. <laughs> then, then, then you're not going to go anywhere. Mm. So reports like this, their use is not just that we discuss them and we entertain ourselves with the numbers and so on. Their use is that they give you a very intelligent picture of the state of affairs. And from there, you must navigate a way forward. That's why you see that many of the countries that do very well have a distinct common feature. They are very data intelligent. They don't just make wild claims. Many places you go to in Ghana, when somebody says something, you ask for the evidence, he says you are too known. But you have to have evidence. Otherwise, why do you make the claims that you make? On that, when it comes to isolating some of the numbers that the statistical service um, put out, I, I found that interesting that as far as exports were concerned, we were doing far more export to the rest of the continent than any other continent. In fact, 13.2 billion CD more exports to the rest of the continent, Africa, I mean, than we are importing. That definitely shows that we aren't actually doing as bad. At least we are taking advantage of, of the free trade area. Well, that's one way of looking at the numbers, but there are several ways of looking at numbers. How are you looking I, at it? I have a marketing background, so <laughs> interpreting data is, is one of the things that you, you do. The question that we must address ourselves to is that with, in spite of the rhetoric of power, around Pan-Africanism, Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, sub-regionalization and so on, only 20% of our exports are done in the sub-region. And 10% of imports. That, in my view, is a contradiction, not of my ideas, not of my rhetoric, of the rhetoric that is, is bandied around. And I tried to look into the data to try and understand what was going on over there. And one of the glaring bits is that 2.5% of our exports go to Nigeria. That is an absolute anomaly. Nigeria is a super nation. Mm. How is it that you do only 2.5%? Because they don't want exports? us. I mean, two years ago, in fact, a year ago, they closed their borders to our products coming in. Isn't that the problem? That's the problem. They, they, they are very protectionist in the orientation. You've been there. You know this. That's why we're struggling to go in. Our traders were complaining. They closed it for weeks and our trucks were stuck at the border and they were not being allowed in. Rice think, in particular. I think there's a difference between journalism and political leadership. The journalists do their work when they report the problem. That's their work. They report the problem, they put the facts on the table. If the politicians also become political leaders only to report the problem to us, then we don't need them. We can make a saving. Their job is to report the problem and say to us what are we going to do about it. Mm -hmm international diplomacy. There are reasons why Nigeria takes the posture that it takes. I, I continue to insist that we are friendly countries with a long history of fraternal relations. And what you have to do is to sit around the table. The major economic powers of the world, they sit together. And when they sit, they don't always see eye to eye. There's a chip war going on between the US and China at the moment, you have to sit down and you negotiate these things. This is why you have a trade minister, this is why you have high commissioners and so on and so forth. And you talk through these things and you come to acceptable compromises that work mutually for the two sides. It's not simple enough, but why haven't we done it? We've had ECOWAS for God knows how long. Now there's the AU, so what's the problem there? Well, I, I've said to you that our neoliberal democracy takes the easy road. We, we avoid the big questions. 
And again, the last time I attacked the media, and I attacked the media again, but this time I, I did also say that the, the media has done well with the trade vulnerability report. Absolutely, they must be giving kudos for it, but it must continue and not only remain an elite conversation, it must go down because a lot of the cross-border trade is not done by the, the elites in society. There are people who, in spite of all these barriers and, and blocks and so on, they manage to move things across borders. Their perspectives are also necessary. But isn't the after, for example, a big idea. Isn't that what exactly you're asking them to do, to think long-term, structurally? Isn't that something you should be applauding at least the continent for? I'm speaking at two marketing conferences this week, one in Kampala and another tomorrow in, in Accra. And one of the things I'll be doing is quoting Wangari Matai. These are long speeches and, and all this rhetoric and so on is not what greens an environment. Digging a hole in the ground putting the seed, watering it for life, rolling up your sleeves, getting dirty, that's what matters. But isn't that what the Africa Free Trade Area is supposed to do? Well, do all the hard lifting? At least they thought about it, they are implementing it. Where's the evidence in the numbers? Well, at least Ghana is exporting 13.2 billion more to the continent than importing compared to the rest of the other continents. 20% of our exports. That's the other way of looking at it. Is that what the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement means when it says that we're promoting intra-African trade? And of that, what you mentioned, you didn't mention that over 50% of it is gold to South Africa. Mm. Uh, over 70% of our exports are coming from gold, from cocoa, and from crude oil. Mm. Now, gold and and crude oil are finite commodities. An extractive industry is, is a finite, some people even call it a sunset industry. So if you build an economy and you say that the, this is free trade and you're, you're doing very well in, in Pan-African trade and so on, and it is built on the extractive industry, which is finite, you are not building capabilities for the future. I pointed out in one interview that I gave with, with another media player, I said that you look at the, at the bar on our machine production capabilities, non-existent. Mm. I had to turn pages several times to be able to see it because it's non-existent. That tells you that we have not built the underlying capabilities. In fact, the this book backs you up. In fact, yeah. the, the top three things we import the most machinery. Yeah. No, but you, you look at the chart. The chart is actually there. The statistical service did a very good job. And even where we say that we, we have industry, what makes it industry? If you read uh, Samir Amin, he did a great analysis on uh, accumulation on a, on a world stage. What really makes it industry? We provide the labor, then we provide some commodities, all the sophisticated machinery we import. So we've not built underlying capabilities. We have energy security issues. These are the big questions of society. When I talk about the big ideas, how are you going to change those fundamental drivers to liberate the productive forces in your economy. That is the challenge of development. Mm. I want to take another break. So, possibly, are coups the answer? <laughs> Aren't they radical enough? That question after this break. Who is the good? Ghana Jollof or Nigerian Jollof? Ghana Jollof has no co-equal. The smell alone. Oh my God. Oh, that shit. You two they lie, eh? Now they say stew. When they use cook the rice, I need to go put them for top. Hey. You are lying. Ooh. Ghana Jollof. Ghana Jollof. <laughs> Put some respect on the goat. On the goat. The only goat I know lives in Tama. Every year, we will give to you back. back, 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 back. We are talking about PET. I want to hear the answer first. Except be the goat, huh? My guy, him be the goat. <laughs> 
our choice of goats may differ in football, music, and jollof. Alumo Bitters always brings us together. Alumo experience greatness in every moment. <laughs> Drink responsibly. Not for sale to persons under 18. Not recommended to pregnant women. This advert is FDA approved. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of flamingo paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of flamingo paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the flamingo superior paint. As you can clearly see, Flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, Flamingo has painted a much larger area. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. Hello there. To provide timely information and to explain educational reforms and to discuss school models and interventions, the Ministry of Education in partnership with the Teacher Education Journal presents to you the first ever education TV talk show, The Edu Talk Show. The Edu Talk Show keeps you informed and updated on trends in the world of education. The Ghanaian teacher is so versatile. Provide him the opportunity, train him, and that teacher will perform wonders. Where are the women? They are doing very well academically, but they're not in the sciences and all of that. So technology is missing a lot more women that they could have had. You need to tell the parents, at the moment, what you are getting is, is covering only an aspect of your child's education. And therefore, it's very difficult for you to make any decision with the limited information you have. We still have more to do mm. when it comes to safe school. Mm. So join us as we speak to our guests on reforms taking place in Ghana's education sector. My name is Blessed Suga and I am your host. Thank you very much for staying with us on PM Express. We've been talking about Ghana and Africa uh, in the context of the 2000 and 2022 Statistical Service Trade Vulnerability Report that really emphasizes the point that in spite of all the volumes of manifestos that always use the phrase changing the structure of the economy, doing away with the gorgeous big economy, we, we're still really standing still as far as our trade is concerned. And my guest, Yael Sako, had actually said we are not being radical enough. He says, actually challenging us to be like what Deng Xiaoping had said, dare to touch the backside of a tiger. So, yeah, let me throw that to you then. That analogy that Deng put out there isn't cool then, the answer to that. <laughs> that is as radical as you get. No, it is not as radical as we get. Coups are an intellectually lazy approach for people who do not want to do the hard political work. And we must absolutely never outsource the political work that is required for development to coup makers. Let us place a magnifying glass over a coup. A coup is not the military acting as an establishment. Because of the, we talk about military takeovers, people make it seem as though the army goes and sits somewhere goes into conclave, and then the entire army says, now we need to intervene because the civilians have messed up. No. This, just as I was driving here, I was reading something that Gabonese new Yusepa has, has mentioned, something that he claims Jerry Rowling said about that the judges fail you and the civilian politicians, so the armed forces must intervene. What is the mandate of the armed forces to intervene? Where does the hierarchy of the armed forces get together and say that they are staging a coup? So when a country turns around on coups, it is playing Russian roulette with its fate. Because a coup, by definition, is a clique of cons conspiratorial elements of the military. It's not the full military acting as an establishment. 
And then they get up and they say that we feel that we must intervene now. And then you have people who are applauding them and saying that uh, the civilians have not delivered and therefore we must try the military. The question I ask is why are those the only options? Why do we now believe that things are so binary that we must choose between corrupt civilians or soldiers who are not accounted? And when these soldiers come, to whom do they account? But we've tried all the options and they failed. Why not cool? I mean, look at the recent case of um, Gabon. 56 years for one family. What haven't they tried in that, in that space? Singapore did it in 30. So after 56, why, why not a coup? The challenge I throw is that Kamu Zubanda was also in power for, you, you can check, I think three decades or so, the Malawian people got rid of him without a coup. Kenneth Kaunda in Zambia, they got rid of him without a coup. So if you're willing, it is the, it is the more difficult route. But you see, we, this, this new liberal environment encourages us. We're always looking for shortcuts. I was just saying before coming here at one university that I, I went to, that our forebears many years ago used to say, there is no shortcut to the top of the palm tree. What they were telling us is that if you want enduring change in society, you have to work hard for it. This thing that we feel that we can outsource structural changes in society to cool makers, I say again, is intellectually lazy. And it is a deep regret, especially in my generation, people who have seen the hazards of coups. When they say we've tried everything and it has not worked, we've also tried coups. So why are we going back to that? You've celebrated the role of the mass movement yeah. in your article on yeah. the trade volume. So why are the masses then jubilating on the streets? In Gabon, in Niger, happy that the coup makers have come to save them. I'm not going to put you in an awkward position, but many people who have said this to me, I've said to them, how did you conclude that the masses are celebrating? Uh, well, seeing is believing. I saw them on the streets. So they, they say they, they watch TV, and I, then I say, in Niger, I bothered to check. The biggest pro-rally, pro-coup rally in Niger, according to Al Jazeera, had an attendance of 30,000 people. Yeah, that's a lot. Okay, so you have 30,000 people. Then I checked with someone who I don't know whether I have the authority to mention his name, but one of the lead journalists from West Africa. I asked him, what is the estimate for the average attendance of the pro-coup rally? He said 2,000. Now, you say 30,000 is a lot, but the population of Niger is 25 million. Yeah. So when 30,000 people gather somewhere and they say that the masses are in support, what do they mean? The masses of the coup makers are mythical. And but, I but challenge people 2, 000, to put the numbers. But even if it's 2,000, protest on the street is always going to be just a representation of, 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 of the rest of the population. So why must the 2,000 de determine the fate of 25 million? That is what I'm pointing at. But they haven't. They're just jubilating what has already happened. Yes, but then they jubilate doesn't then mean that the coup has mass support. That's the point I'm trying to make. So, yes, the 2,000 people are free to jubilate. They are happy with brigands stepping in and, and, and overturning the cart and staging a coup. You know that I'm very critical of neoliberal politics and what it has become in Ghana. So I'm not saying I'm happy with the status quo. But the point I'm making is that in spite of my dissatisfaction and disaffection for the status quo, I am clear in my mind that a coup is not the answer. So what do you do about the Gabon example? Because that's, a, that's a quite a, not all two coups are the same. Yeah. What do you say about that too? How long did the ANC fight to win power in South Africa against the But they the took arms system? at the point. In yeah. to resist way. They did exactly that. The spear of the nation. They were setting up bombs for train stations as terror. People are confusing armed struggle in revolution with coups. The two are not the same. And if they had the chance, they would have. No, the, the Nkonto we see is where Operation Maibuye is what you are talking yes. about, was actually action that was driven by an established political party, the ANC. You take Fidel, uh, Kagame with the, R with the RPF, and so Ho Chi Minh, and so on and so forth. These were people based mass movements. But they that, took up that took arms. Up, yeah, but that you take up arms doesn't mean that you and I. We, we gather in a room and then... But we, the objective 
was the same, no. was to make the government unpopular, no. was to put pressure. At least in the South African case, no. that's why they did what they did. No, it's again a total misread of the situation. The South African situation, Operation Maibuye, was launched after there was a massacre. That's when they took up arms because they said the state but, but why? had now militarized the struggle. So, so but, so, why but, it, but that is not a coup d'etat. For, for they, deliberate they were campaigning. As a reaction to the... To the no, they were the campaigning massacre. publicly. They were talking, Maibuye, Operation Maibuye was launched with a charter written, I think, by Joe Slovo. They were talking, so that is a very different situation, like Shea and Fidel and Raul and so on and so forth. But both of them took up arms. Yeah, yeah. I have no problems with armed struggle if it's done, Mao took up arms. If it is done openly and it is mass, it is a mass movement, that's a very different thing from that somebody gets up and then says that I shoot my way to power because I have five, six people, ragtag, bandits, and then they just come and they say that they've shot They've shot their way, and we must accept it. So, and, and what are the examples? Mm. We talk about it as if Idi Amin, Jerry Rawlings, Sonny Abacha, they all emerged saying populist things. In, in, in Nigeria, actually, when Sonny Abacha emerged, some of the pro-democracy movements celebrated some of the lead figures because Nigeria was in a crisis. Ibrahim Badamoshi Babaginda had annulled the election that had, had brought forward Moshu Kashmao Abiola, and as a result of that, they thought that Abacha was the answer. And they said, well, maybe it's a welcome intervention. It brings some order. Fate, political fate said, hold my beer. Within months, Abacha showed them his true nature. This was one of the worst medros brigands and bandits ever. I, so you I don't you know that. what you gamble for when you have a coup. But how do you deal with the Gabon scenario when one not party, one family has been involved up to six. What, what do you do? What do you leave the people? What options do they have? It is a political question. The solution must be political. But definitely people have tried. The opposition parties have tried and have felt, in fact, another election that people, the, the consensus is that was not free and fair, triggered this latest coup. What, what, what options do people have? You are talking about structural change as, as if it is eating fast food. Or this is the Twitter generation. You belong to that generation, so they always want everything very quickly. But no. But 56 years, yeah, you know, is a long time. It is a reflect- in the context of what we've talked about. Where others have done it in three decades. It is a reflection of two things. It is a reflection of the trenchant corruption of the status quo, the equivalent of the ancien regime in Gabon. That is right. But it is also a reflection of an emasculated opposition that is not able to organize. So you have to think about the two variables. One is to step back and organize better. Mm. But do you at least agree, uh, before we wrap up, that what we see in the sub-region is just a reflection of people's grievance at this failed democratic dividend? We just haven't seen that dividend, the masses. I agree that democracy has not delivered the dividend that we all expected. I absolutely agree, and the last time I was here, I spoke about the danger that it poses, that it could lead to some of these things. That what is happening is a reflection, I'm not totally convinced, because I say that I have not seen the numbers. Mm. That say to me that this, the claim that there is mass support for the coups is real. I keep repeating, the masses of the coup makers are mythical. Mm. I'd like to see the number. 30,000 people gathered at a rally does not make that that uh, mass support, there are 25 million people in the country, where are the rest of them? Final one, is, Ga- is Ghana immune? Ghana cannot be immune. Uh, uh, we have a huge amount of poverty in, in the country, there's a huge amount of restiveness. So we say in, in uh, local parlance that when you see your neighbor's beard on fire, you should get a pail of water by the side. We must be thinking very carefully. The solution is not that you become draconian and, and go after people and so on and so forth and stop people speaking, and try and handcuff the military. The solution is that this de- democracy must deliver shared prosperity and shared dignity. That is really the, the way, the, again going back to Deng, he said as prosperity went up in China, crime started to go down, especially violent crime. Mm. So that is the route forward, in my view. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for having me again. Thank you. Best wishes.